that you do. And the sort of final component of the project in terms of just how it worked was, was this Games Time Citizen Media um, site that we produced called Citizen 2014, which was basically between in the, in the Games Time when the Commonwealth Games were actually on, we worked again with the partners who'd been involved in the project, the participants who'd been involved to create create a kind of news, essentially a news wire that took place during the games themselves. Uh, and, and again, that was really useful and really valuable as a way of kind of bringing the partners that we'd been involved in the project together to do something live, to do something that actually happened over the course of, 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 a, of a week or two during the games time. And I just wanted just to now, in the last kind of, sort of few slides, talk a little bit about this, the kind of idea of, 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 of taking the principles that we'd set out into practice and some of the sort of ways in which that was that was made real to people who were involved in the project. And these are just a set of questions that we that we produced answers for when we worked with the participant groups. Because you know, when you do a media-related project, whether you're a practitioner doing just delivering a media project or you're actually researcher stroke practice practitioners doing this kind of work, there are a series of complexities that you have to have to deal with that, that we had to try and encompass within our learning materials and within the, the workshops that we, we ran. So, you know, issues around about content, about who, uh, who owns the content, where does it, where's it going to reside? How long will it be there for? How long is it going to stay online for? Um, you know, what kind of platforms do, you, do we want to use? And again, lots of projects like these use a specific platform. They, they say that we're doing it on, only on this site and you have to produce all the content that can work for that site. We tried as a result of what our, I guess the principles were to try and be able to pull in content from, from whatever platform the, the individuals wish to use. And again, that was, sorry, that was quite useful um, because it enabled people to, to work with the platforms they felt most comfortable with. Uh, and we could find ways to, to pull that into the, to the website, that, that we would pull that in quite easily um, and, and, and then share it more widely. Um, so again, we, we, lots of these sort of questions that we had to provide answers for, and we did that as part of the learning materials that we that we provided. And, and I'll talk a bit about how that the challenge of taking a project from 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 practice, if you like, to do research uh, in the last couple of slides. So example here's just a couple of examples of the the sorts of responses that we provided to some of those questions. Um, both in terms, and this is where the digital literacies and the digital media literacies in particular come in, I think, because you know, it's fine to say we want everyone to produce lots of interesting content, but actually, A, that's quite difficult without support if people haven't had the experience in the past. And B, we need to know where that goes. We need to know what that means that it goes there, that there is some kind of residue, that there's a, there's a, a digital footprint for those individuals involved in the project that, that we need them to be aware of. Uh, and that they could choose and that they knew that they were participating in the media project and that they knew the content would be on the website. Uh, unless they they wish that you know not to be there, or they they want to understand when they could how they could take it down, or how they could ask for it to be withdrawn. Um, and again, over time, that was important, especially when we thought about the archiving potential of of, of this website. And um, so again, you, you can read these, but just some of the kind of pieces of advice that we had to provide as part of the project to make sure people were were literate. They they knew what they were doing and why they were doing it, and they could make an informed choice about whether they wished their content to be available. And there were a couple of examples that I'll talk about uh, just towards the end, where you have people felt that you know, who were involved in some kind of political campaign, or maybe were particularly um, critical of the games, were 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 anxious when they realised that material would, to go, would potentially go public and where that where it would be found. And, and and again, that was part of the sort of workshop. So in some cases, groups didn't produce content and put it online because of that. So these are the sort of things you do have to be careful of when doing projects like these. And again, so. That, that's what the project looked like, the Digital Commonwealth project, and there's lots more information on that if you, if you wish to discuss it. But again, I now want to br bring it back, if you like, to the, the practices research dimension of the project and the sorts of, I guess, questions that we were asked or that we had to deal with, that I think are useful for other people who are using the kind of media projects maybe that I've talked about within their own work, within their own research, and maybe, and maybe some of you in the room. Um, not all of these we have answers to, and that's, I think, partly uh, what we want to discuss, if that's possible at the end, but the sorts of questions at least we were asked. So you know, when you're working in with communities, and it's nice to think that you are working with communities, some that may be disenfranchised, some that may be a little disempowered or on the margins and not have that much of a voice, um, you still have these big challenges when you decide to work with those communities around about issues of legitimacy. So 
you know, what sort of credibility do you have as a as, a, as an academic or as an individual, as a creative practitioner to work in that space? Uh, and what are your intentions? What are you trying to achieve? And is that something that's shared with those group members that you wish to participate with? We have to think very carefully about organisations that we already worked with, with individuals we'd worked with, and develop relationships to ensure that we were viewed as being credible, that we, our intentions were, were good, that we were trying to think about digital media as a project and not simply to, for example, be involved in, a, in, a, in approaching this from some sort of political or critical side. Um, and we know that in that broader sports uh, events media, there, there's quite a lot of debate around about alternative media and and particularly some of the radical media and, and what their maybe intentions may be. So that was a quite a difficult balancing act for us in terms of being able to, to do a project like this without being accused or, or of, of being in that space or that space being problematic for us. But that relates to the same issues about sort of power differentials between researchers and the research um, participants in the project and practitioners, uh, and also kind of broadly media politics uh, and, and what that might mean. So we were working with some quite marginalised populations um, who were relatively vulnerable in some situations, and we had to approach the project in that way and think about, well, what are the implications of producing media? What are the implications for those individuals and their communities? And what are the implications for them in terms of how they may be perceived. And that was something we had to work through as part of workshops. But that was, that was again, a deliberate dimension of the project to try and deal and, 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 and try and help those individuals and groups and organizations understand the, the media world that they are now operating within. Uh, and so the whole idea of working, for example, with community media organizations was about saying, well, actually, you, 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 you do need to be literate. You do need to understand where it goes, which platforms you're using, and what that might mean in terms of the data that you produce and, and ownership of that data, for example. But undoubtedly, because some people felt vulnerable, then th this idea of the sort of paucity of resources and I mean that across the kind of economic, cultural and social resources uh, did mean that some people felt very, very un uh, concerned about being involved and we had to manage that as part of the process that we were involved in. And that extends to this idea of responsibility for, for outputs and outcomes. So who, who, who has that responsibility and who produces outputs and where do they go and where do they reside and for how long do they reside there? And I'll sort of talk about that in the last slide about some of the challenges there around about producing material, and producing, for example, research outputs, producing practice outputs as well. And working similarly to the, the sort of power differentials about trust and about how you build that trust and sustain that with the participants. And for example, schools were, were really interesting because there was a fear from schools about doing digital media work. Some environments, some local authorities were very, very engaged with the process and felt this was a great opportunity to help young people to engage, understand the media they're producing and actually to do so within a, within a, a, a literacy environment. Others were concerned because of, of, of anything going out public from the school, because that's not something they'd experienced before um, and it's something that they weren't that well prepared to deal with. Um, so again, one of the sort of objectives of the project was to try and work with those schools to think yeah, about carefully about how they might put boundaries around about that, some frameworks around about how they might think about who had permission to develop materials in school premises and for those school, school that material to, to go out beyond the school gates, if you like. Um, what we found, of course, was that it was happening anyway with young people using devices, etc. But the school wasn't really engaging with that. And I think that was one of the things that I think really really came out of our project was really important is, is that schools needed to be much more engaged with, with understanding what was already happening, but also thinking about putting that within a framework, an ethical framework and a, and a practice framework so that young people were actually being supported to think about the sorts of media they were producing on an everyday basis um, on their phones, for example, but also uh, what that might mean for the school and whether you could actually contain all that material within the school. Um, and, and I guess the last point here, which I'll, I'll, I'll emphasise in, in the last slide, is around about ethics and about the process of, of working in a practice research environment, uh, how you secure eth uh, ethical approval as part of a, being a researcher in, a, in an academic environment, as well as actually the ethics of the process and working with um, relatively marginalised populations. Uh, and I guess the point we make here is that it's, it's, it's an ongoing process and, and not a, a dynamic process, something that needs to be constantly engaged with around about issues of consent, for example. Okay, so second last slide, and then we can then hopefully I'll try and sum up, and we can sort of try and talk about these issues in, in discussion and in questioning. Um, and again, I just want to, to relate this to the, more to the academic context in terms of positioning uh, the researcher within these kind of projects or this kind of project. Um, so we 
a couple of us researchers were involved in the project, we were ab absolutely active participants um, and, and very much in, in keeping with that sort of co-production kind of ethos. Whilst always being aware that that, that co-production is, 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 is problematic, it's, it's hard to see ourselves as equal given that in some ways uh, the project was funded and therefore there were people who were prepared to be involved in the project and, and those that weren't. Um, but very much, with, at least with that, that ethos, that actually the, the, the participatory practice was something that helped, could help us produce insights and learning around about the ideas of digital media literacy in particular. Um, so for both the projects that I've been involved in recently, the Citizen Relay and the Digital Commonwealth Project, um, you know, we sought to work hard before the project to develop trust with the sort of organisations and individuals and groups that we were working with. Um, and we also involved them in dissemination and in communication about the project output. So both the funders that were involved, but also participant groups involved in, in helping us with that process. And we, and we very much tried to do that as we went along. So we, we, we encouraged all the, the participant organisations to help us by blogging about their activities and sharing that more widely. Um, but also in, in academic settings, we worked uh, and ensured that our materials were had been subject to the views of those who were already involved in the project before we shared them. But that's still difficult, and, and, and it, there is still that feeling when you do these sort of projects that you are at some level extracting from, from others, and, and that's something I think that's, that's never easy and it never really goes away. Um, I guess the other thing is that the pro projects like these, they kind of transform how we might think about research, and the researcher is, is that sort of detached, uh, neutral or distant kind of individual who's involved in a, in a project. Um, as opposed to sort of practice research works, which I think does can draw out sort of quite complex insights, but it's not traditional in the way that we think about, well, I went in and did a piece of research and I'm now able to go and publish upon that. So it does make us continually think around about that ethical um, approval process that I mentioned a, a minute ago. Um, but I do think there's real value in kind of being embedded within that space and actually having to work through the complexities of dealing with with people who are in a different position from yourself, who aren't necessarily paid to be in that, that role, um, and actually working with com quite complex communities and thinking about what that means for you as a researcher and how you go about your practice. So in that sense, I think it's a really valuable process and, and one that in a broader kind of areas that Andrea and, and colleagues are interested in, then these challenges will come up. And so just to, just to sort of conclude in terms of, of this part of the, uh, of the presentation before we have discussion, um, the, the idea of having principles at the beginning and setting principles out that we try and embedded, we tried to embed, sorry, in everything that we did as part of the project that I've described, the Digital Commonwealth project, uh, it, it still doesn't really deal with some of the kind of ongoing sense of interactions that you have. You have to constantly revisit what those are and revisit that they're embedded within the project that you're working with, because it's very easy to post them online or put them on a website and say, this is what we do, why we do it much more difficult to ensure that that translates right to a project, uh, right through the delivery of a project, but also potentially in the, in the, in the dissemination of the project to, at the end. Um, that's something I hope we did, but it's, it's something that, again, I would say it's, it's, it's always partial and it's always temporary. Um, there is a challenge, I think, with project-focused work as academics, and, and, and we're, we're bidding for work, or we're doing research projects, or we're doing practice-related projects, knowledge exchange projects. There is a tendency for that to be project focused and that potentially it starts and it ends at a point and then you, you move away, you, you walk away from that project. The nature of some of the work that, that I've been involved in recently is that it's it's continued on in terms of the same communities or groups have been involved in some of that work. So the intention is to try and sustain that in some way. But there's also this challenge of the sort of cultural memory or the memory that that, that, that material that was that was produced you know, four years ago is, is, is still available online, it's still there. Are, are the participants aware of that? How do they think about, about the longevity of that? Uh, are they happy with something being archived? So, for example, this project was archived, and some of the questions you're asked when you think about archiving a project like this is, you know, what sort of, what sort of consent did you get at the beginning? You know, can we see those forms for everyone who was involved? Where, you know, where, did you do debriefs with all those individuals? So these were things that we had to really sort of go back and rehearse with the, with the groups that we were involved in when we considered the, the, the ability for this to be archived and to be available for a longer time period. Um, so again, any project where you're producing content, I think it's, it's worth really thinking about that at the beginning because the, the questions they ask is, are really useful for you to think about a, a practice project. Um, so again, I just reinforce this idea of the, the, uh, important, I think, to embed 
within a digital project like this, the, the ideas of critical digital citizenship, thinking about where people can, through their own practice, actually consider how what it's like to, to live in a digital mediated world. Um, and, and those sort of issues that I've mentioned a number of times around about ownership, around about privacy, but also the rights and, and identity online. You know, how do people wish to be perceived? How, how do they wish to be to be to be um, perceived when, they, when when someone searches for their material, their content, for example, becomes available to them? Um, again, we this was a project that, that that integrated making and doing. We got people to do things. We got them to make things. We got them to think about the, the digital literacy as issues that come up when you produce that piece of content, that piece of audio that then is posted online, is shared, is retweeted by a number of people. Um, and what that might mean and, 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 and understanding the sort of audience that, that may be then there for them. Um, and again, just, just to, sort of, to, to finalise, the idea of, sort of project focused uh, work does challenge us, I think, in terms of ethics. Um, so participatory research like the digital research that, that I've been involved in, then you know, there are challenges round about the very process of securing um, uh, permissions. And, and that can sometimes feel invasive, but sometimes it could feel right at the beginning of a really exciting project that that, that becomes an obstacle, that people feel uh, concerned about why am I having to ask for this sort of permission? This seems very detailed. So there's a really interesting debate about how you can do this and what a, a university ethics panel are interested in versus how you can gain the trust and, and, and support of the, the people you wish to work alongside or with to help them to produce something in a, in a kind of un, in an understanding and well-informed manner. Um, so, so the whole idea of informed consent and how, how that's continuing on, I think, needs to be much more focused on the process. So you, of course, have to engage with these formal processes, but you also need to maintain this throughout the sort of learning or the project that you're involved in to ensure that, that there's an ongoing, as I've described here, sort of conversation around about consent uh, and that people understand what, where, where the material they're produced or maybe involved in producing is going to go. So I'm going to leave it at that. Hopefully that's not been too long. I probably have gone a little bit over time. Um, but I would like now, obviously, to, to, to open up to questions. There's lots of, sort of thoughts here that need more clarification and, and that need more um, explanation. So I'm happy to hear people with some questions, and hopefully I can try and do it.